Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Last Wrestling Podcast. Because if I have a wrestling podcast, absolutely everybody else in the world does too, and therefore it is completely without value. Well, fortunately for me, apparently, there remains a total of 17 people on planet Earth who do not realize that they do actually have a wrestling podcast. So, I can still sneak in some sort of residual value in my opinions. So, tonight we are going to be doing a live-ish review of New Japan Pro Wrestling's G1 Special in San Francisco. First of all, no it isn't. The show is not actually taking place in San Francisco, California. It is taking place just outside the city limits in the city of Daly City. D-A-L-Y. It's either Daly or Daly. This is just on the border of San Francisco, but is not technically in San Francisco. But that's okay, because this is taking place at the Cow Palace. Now, the Cow Palace is a famous arena in the history of professional wrestling. Uh, this venue has hosted wrestling events in the California area since the 1960s. The idea for the arena was inspired by the popularity of a livestock pavilion at the 1915 Panama, Panama Pacific International Expo. A local newspaper asked as early as May 1935, why, when people are starving, should money be spent on a palace for cows? And that Palace for Cows somehow got turned around into Cow Palace. Uh, the palace has also hosted professional wrestling events under various promoters, most notably Roy Shire, who ran cards there from the early 60s to 1981, oftentimes to sold-out houses headlined by Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, and others. After Shire ended operations, other promotions such as the WWF and WCW moved in. Notable cards include WCW's Super Brawl in 97, 98, and 2000, and WWE's No Way Out in 2004. And this place has also had basically every sport under the sun has worked at the Cow Palace. Uh, it was host of the 1956 Republican National Convention to renominate Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, and the 1964 Republican nominate National Convention, which nominated Barry Goldwater, which obviously didn't go quite so well. Uh, the Beatles have played here, the Rolling Stones have played here, the Jackson 5, the Who, Grateful Dead, uh, Pink Floyd, a whole bunch of just Elvis Presley, a whole bunch of just names. This is a... If you're into sort of the live event, live sports, live concert, etc. scene in the United States, this is kind of a big deal. So for New Japan to be allowed to run this place, this is good. Okay, now looking at the card for this evening. And we're going to start with the main event. And many thanks to ProWrestling.net for having this up in a way that is completely spoiler-free, because I'm a couple of days, as always, late watching this. In the main event, for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, Kenny Omega makes his first title defense against Cody. Um, not expecting a title change there. Jay White versus... Well, sorry, Jay White will defend the IWGP US title against Juice Robinson... Maybe a title change here? I don't know. 50-50. Uh, uh, Juice Robinson is a more overact than Jay White, so um, I wouldn't blame them for putting the belt on him. Uh, third from the top, we've got Hiromu Takahashi defending the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship against Dragon Lee. No chance in hell. Is there going to be a title change there? Uh, in tag team action, the former heavyweight champion, Kazuch uh, Kazuchika Okada, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm used to reading these in Japanese, Okada Kazuchika is easier for me to say, um, and Will Ospreay, former uh, junior heavyweight champion, will face the uh, Los Ingobernables de Japón team of Tetsuya Naito and Bushi. Uh, for the IWGP uh, Tag Team Championship, Heavyweight Tag Team Championships, the Young Bucks will defend against Evil and Sonata in a return match. Hiroki Goto will face Jeff Cobb for the Never Openweight Championship, and I have no idea who the hell that is. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kushida versus Marty Skrull and Hangman Page. 
uh, Toru Yano and Tomohiro Ishii versus Minoru Suzuki and Zack Sabre Jr. That's going to be a beat the piss out of somebody and Toru Yano gets the pin. Or Toru Yano gets pinned. And in our opening match, oh, may the wrestling gods have mercy on my soul. Sho, Yo, Rocky Romero, Yoshihashi, and Gedo versus Chase Owens, Yujiro Takahashi, Tangaloa, Tama Tonga, and King Haku, also known as Ming, coming out of retirement to team with his sons in a 10-man tag team. I'm just going to go out on a limb right now and say Cluster Mess. And since Ghetto is on one of these teams, he will be the one taking the pin. The question is, who pins him? Okay, so we are starting off with a rather lovely shot of the Cow Palace on the out, uh, from the outside, and uh, it does look it does look like um, we're not going to have our usual announce team. I can hear the, the dulcet tones of the living legend, good old J.R. Jim Ross, coming into my ears. And he's teaming up with Josh Barnett, who is a person. And neither of them, and this is important, neither of them are Cyrus. So, I'm happy. Uh, Jim Ross, the best ever, period. Uh, the voice of a generation of yeah, professional wrestling, no doubt. It's a privilege for any wrestler to have him call one of their matches at this point. Um, unfortunately, there have been a lot of technical issues when these two have taken the reins for the U.S. shows of New Japan. So, hopefully, since last year, they will have gotten over that. I'm not really holding out a lot of hope. But I'm now going to tune in to the opening of the show, see if there's anything interesting there, and if... Uh, if there is, I'll come back here and talk about it. If not, um, we'll just get to the first match, which will be the 10-man cluster mess. Here goes nothing. Credit to New Japan. Hang on, let me get my microphone back on my face. Credit to New Japan. That was a really good video intro. It took quite a while, but they ran down all the major matches of the card, all the title matches. And proved that they know how to tell a story in English. In fact, it was pretty obvious that the guy doing the narration was uh, an American who did not speak a great deal of Japanese because he mispronounced about half the Japanese words that he said. Fortunately, he got all the names right, so beyond that, it doesn't really matter. All right, so no putting it off anymore. First match, 10-man tag, Roppongi 3K, Ghetto, uh and a whole bunch of other people, including a whole bunch of Tongans. Okay, well, first of all, I was right. Uh, Ghetto taking the pin uh, from one of the Gorillas of Destiny, a little father-son combination to finish them out, and good. I'm glad that, that Ghetto is in this position, that he's willing to do this. Uh, for some anyone who doesn't know, and I'm going to, you know, break a little kayfabe here, uh, Ghetto is actually the booker. Uh, the promoter, the uh, the matchmaker, the writer, the creative guy behind um, New Japan Pro Wrestling at the moment, and has been for a couple of years now. And I like that he's got a such a lack of ego that when he puts himself in the ring, when he books himself in a match, he books himself to lose. So that everybody else on his team stays strong because they didn't get the pin, and everybody on the other team looks good because they won the match. So credit to Ghetto for doing that. And that's pretty much the end of the positive right now because I think this show is going to suck. And here's why. One of the biggest technical difficulties they had the last time they did one of these US uh, G1 specials was that the English commentary team was not being clued in on when it was their time to speak. So for pretty much the entire entrances, we had Jim Ross and Josh Barnett talking over the ring announce. New Japan has this interesting thing they do for big shows where they have two ring announcers. They've got the English ring announcing, which quite frankly, I could do a better job with that with my you know, one hand tied behind my back. Uh, that happens as the wrestlers are coming down the, the aisle. And then you've got the official Japanese introduction, which happens when they're in the ring. 
And the entire time for both teams, Ross and Barnett were talking over that. My guess is they weren't clued in on when the announcers were talking. So, uh, we also have a situation, we've had it a couple of times already, and we're half an hour into a, oh god, four plus hour show. Uh, nobody, I don't think anybody's giving the English announcers time cues, because quite a bit of it, it seems like, uh, now, during the match, while the match is taking place, they're fine. It's Jim Ross, he's lost a step in his old age, but he's still fantastic, but outside of that, it does kind of seem like they're sort of filling and stretching to try to figure out, um, when they're supposed to stop. Because I don't think anyone's giving them a countdown or a count out. So, ugh, if that's going to be a problem the rest of the night, which given last year, I think it probably will be, this is going to suck. Alright, uh, moving on now. Coming up next, we have a tag team match, two on two. Toro Yano and Tomohiro Ishii versus Minoru Suzuki and Zack Sabre Jr. We saw this, I think, exact same match um, at the last show that we did. So, at uh, Dominion. And it was a good match. Don't really care to see it again, but here we go. Well, this match was exactly what you would expect it to be on paper. Um, a lot of the action was... Uh, Tomohiro Ishii and Minoru Suzuki beating the ever-loving piss out of each other. Uh, Toru Yano making an idiot of himself. Zack Sabre Jr. tying people up in knots. And it was exactly what it was supposed to be. It was a showcase match for these four characters being themselves, doing their thing. Uh, with a surprising quick roll-up, uh, Toru Yano actually wins the match, defeating... Uh, Tomohiro Ishii, sorry, uh, defeating Minoru Suzuki, and that pissed Suzuki off. Badly. Not as good as the, uh, the post-match brawl after Dominion, but it was okay. It was the second match on the card. It wasn't supposed to be better than it was. Moving on to yet another tag team we really don't care match. I, I know I'm being very negative here, but I do like New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's just that their cards take a while to get off the ground. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kushida versus Marty Skrull and Hangman Page. So it's essentially going to be New Japan versus Bullet Club yet again. Uh, one good bit of news. It does look like somebody finally decided to, uh, to smarten up the announce team. Because they weren't talking over the ring announcement this time. That's good. I hope that keeps up the rest of the show. But um, actually, I'm expecting Marty Skrull to pin Kushida on this one. I'm probably completely off base. and going to make a right idiot out of myself if I haven't already. But here we go. Another special tag match. Actually, correction. They're not even bothering to call them special tag matches this time. Well, I was half right. Uh, Kushida did take the pin, but it was actually Hangman Page that uh, made the cover, and in retrospect, I probably should have seen that coming. Uh, this was just another match. I like New Japan Pro Wrestling. I really, really do. The problem is, the first half of their card is usually paint-by-numbers. It's not garbage. It's good wrestling. It's well-wrestled. These guys are incredibly skillful. They know their characters for the most part. Still trying to figure out what the hell a Switchblade Jay White is, but we'll get back to him later. It doesn't feel like, A, that it matters, or B, that these guys aren't just, you know, going through the, the, the best of list. They're going through their, you know, the spots that people expect from them, the character work that people expect from them, and just paint by numbers so bleh fortunately we're getting into the matches that actually matter and that means titles titles on the line five championships as jr essex has explained multiple times already we have got five championships on the line tonight 
The first is Hiroki Goto defending the Never Openweight Championship against Jeff Cobb. Oh, may the Aztec gods forgive me. Um, I did a quick, during the last match, I did a quick Wikipedia search on Jeff Cobb. I am a fan of Lucha Underground. I am a very big fan of Lucha Underground. And now I know something that I didn't know before this, and I really wish I didn't now. I'm not going to spoil it for anybody. If you want to know the, the, the name behind and the face, even worse, behind a very popular mask in Lucha Underground, a very important mask in Lucha Underground, well, it's Jeff Cobb. And I'm a little scared to see this guy wrestle as himself. He's going up against Hiroki Goto. I do not expect a title match. Sorry, I do expect a title match. I don't expect a title change tonight because, well, he doesn't work for Lucha... He, does, he works for Lucha Underground. He doesn't work for New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's a guest. He's local. But he's not one of their guys. And while I could understand putting the Intercontinental title on Chris Jericho, try to get one of your, frankly, extraneous belts out of the promotion for a little while and build it up as something important when Jericho does come back to defend it. I don't think they're getting rid of the Never Open Weight title, especially not to somebody like Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb, that sounds like it should be like a farming gimmick, like corn on the cob or something. All right, here goes probably a great deal of what I like about Lucha Underground. Yippee. Keep your mask on. Keep your mask on. Keep your mask on. Okay, seriously though, that was actually a good match. I am not impressed by Jeff Cobb at all. His alter ego in Lucha Underground is a superior character in virtually every single way. Athletically, the man is gifted. That's going to show up in any character. Throughout this entire match, I had no idea who Jeff Cobb was. He was a big guy that is really strong and can throw you around. That's it. There was nothing there. There were, there were no additional layers to the character. And frankly, he looked like he was wearing ring gear that he bought off of the internet like last week. So, very disappointed in the Jeff Cobb version of the character. Um, I, I like the guy. I really respect the man as a performer, as a wrestler. And I think he's got a lot of potential if he, one, shuts up, does not speak ever again. And two, he's been handed one of the best characters in the last, mm, let's say, 10 years of professional wrestling. He should stick with that. And he should make that work as much as he can. And I think he will get work with that as much as possible. All right, the story of the actual match, and we do have a match that had a story to it now, was that Goto doesn't really know much about this Cobb guy, which, to be fair, neither did I going into this. And he is trying to figure out what is the answer, what is the solution to the Jeff Cobb equation? How do I overcome the fact that this man is bigger and stronger than I am? And it turns out the solution is toughness, strong style, fighting spirit, that sort of thing. And it was a good match with a good narrative in the ring and on commentary. And, um, of course, Hiroki Goto retains the title. But he, gave, he sold a lot for Cobb, gave Cobb a lot of offense. Cobb kicked out of some really impressive maneuvers. The big story coming out of this match for me is that while New Japan Pro Wrestling may be the top non-WWE wrestling promotion in the world, Lucha Underground is the best. And I make a distinction there. New Japan is, I think pretty much everybody is agreed number two. Lucha Underground is the best wrestling in the world. And the best storytelling, hands down. That's including WWE. Uh, next match will be for the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Titles. The Zayang Bucks 
representing the Golden Elite, will defend the titles against former champions Evil and Sanada. Now, um, I don't keep up with the ancillary materials, being the elite, that sort of thing. So, I hope there's a reason that these guys are getting... Uh, sorry, these guys. Evil and Sonata are getting uh, a title match. Because one of my biggest pet peeves with WWE, and I just call this lazy writing, is the idea of the automatic rematch. You don't earn a title match by losing a title. Now, if there's shenanigans, if there's a disputed call, if you're unsure, if there, was, if there was any reason that it wasn't a clean finish, then yes, you can have a storyline that gives you a good reason to book an, an immediate return match. Okay. But the idea that you lost, therefore you get a rematch, I hate that. And I really hope New Japan is not following that lead and is not falling for that trap. What is there to say, really? If you like the Young Bucks, you will like this match. If you don't like the Young Bucks, you will hate this match. This was a typical Young Bucks spot fest. I thought it was pretty good. They took a few risks, but they didn't go crazy with it. They were overly reliant on tropes. We saw the rough bump. We saw the sneaky steel chair. We saw kicking out of each other's finishers. We saw using the other team's finisher on them and having them kick out. But in the end, uh, Meltzer Driver and the Young Bucks make their first retention, uh, their first defense of the heavyweight tag team titles. A repeat from Dominion plus, frankly, a few spots that wouldn't be out of place on a Chikara show. There was a sequence early in the match where uh, you might think of it as the human centipede where three participants of the bout had submission holds. I think it was um, a figure four headlock on each other in sort of a human chain. And then the last guy, which was one of the young bucks, I honestly can't tell the difference half the time, grabs the legs of the guy at the end and, tw and twists him into a sharpshooter, thereby twisting everybody else down the chain, and it looked, well, quite frankly, it looked fake as shit. One thing that I have noticed over the course of this show is that they don't seem to have a problem portraying the Japanese talent as the heels, and the American, and the, well, the Gaijin talent, the American talent so far, as the babyfaces, which... On the one hand, I like because it means they're willing to be flexible with their audience. I've seen Japanese promotions in the past that have tried to expand into the U.S. and have failed because they insisted on putting the Japanese talent on a pedestal above the American talent, looking at you, Dragon Gate. And I'm glad New Japan is not falling for that trap. On the other hand, I'm a fan of consistent storytelling. The fact that you happen to be in another country shouldn't change your character alignment. At least there's no storyline reason for that to be there. Yes, the fans are going to react to you a bit differently, but if you start playing into that, what's the storyline reason for that? They're booing me, so I'm going to kick a guy in the nuts? That doesn't make any sense, especially if you're a person who wouldn't do that, if you're a character that would not do that. We are now officially halfway through the card, and nowhere near halfway through the show. They are taking a 15-minute intermission, which seems like a good enough reason for me to go to bed. Be back on the other side with the second half of G1 Special in San Francisco... Sort of, kind of, but not really. Live-ish review. My god, New Japan is good when it comes to these uh, pa uh, video packages. The For a good chunk of the, actually the majority of the intermission time, we had Jim Ross and Joss Barnett uh, essentially running down the rest of the card, most of it. We got a over highlight uh, package, we got a rundown of the Hiromu and Dragon Lee match and their rivalry, their history, the fact that Dragon Lee took Hiromu's mask. And if you know anything about Lucha Libre, you know that's a big deal. We got a rundown on the U.S. title match. 
including um, some interviews that they did with the new president of New Japan Pro Wrestling that I talked about on the last uh, live-ish review of Dominion. And then we got a really in-depth, very well-produced history package. This wasn't a this wasn't a promo. This wasn't uh, a preview of the of the main event. This was the history going into the main event, and basically the whole story of Cody and Kenny Omega's rivalry over the leadership of Bullet Club thus far including footage from Ring of Honor. And since I don't really follow Ring of Honor that closely, I didn't see Supercard of Honor, which is uh, one of their big shows, uh, their Supercard. That put things in a bit of a different light for me when it comes to this main event. Um, I'm pretty sure now the Young Bucks will be involved in the finish, and I think we're hopefully going to get final confirmation on wh whose side the Young Bucks are on, assuming they're both on the same side. At the moment, we are now halfway through the show, and with a little bit more background, we move in to the next match. Well, we actually did get something called a special tag match. And it was. This was a classic tag team match, by which I mean it was two teams of two people thrown together to uh, basically preview future matches. I'm not going to complain about that, because I do that in the AWL all the freaking time. At least I'm nice enough to hang a lampshade on it. Uh, Okada and Naito is one of those feuds that you, you can keep going back to until people get sick of it, and they're not sick of it yet. As JR mentioned on commentary, there's a, a reasonable seed that's been planted that Naito Okada will be the final of the G1 Climax tournament this year. And this is when we started getting... Uh, matches with G1 Climax implications, Okada and Naito are in opposite blocks of the tournament. So the only way they're going to meet is if it's in the finals. So are they setting that up? Maybe? I don't know. Most of this match was essentially wrestlers pairing off with their equal and opposites. Okada with Naito and Bushi with uh, Will Ospreay. Okada has also debuted a new, well, I don't think, this isn't actually the debut, but it's the first uh, New Japan show, with his new look. Uh, gone is the gold, gone is the jacket, gone are the chains, and uh, now he is wearing these black and red long pants with almost Young Bucks-like fringe on the side, and a very simple black t-shirt with uh, the arms cut off. Now that he's lost the title, he's lost the gold. He's lost the... They're still calling him the Rainmaker. But he seems to have lost that rich man, opulent, decadent aspect of his character. Which I think is a great idea, because people were starting to get sick of it. I wasn't. I still love the guy. But... A lot of people were getting sick of that version of the character. A lot of the match... This one actually did get out of first gear, unlike some of the matches earlier tonight. But a lot of it was still the best of. It was still the, the greatest hits. If you go to a concert for a band that's doing their, you know, their 74th uh, retirement tour, you get... You know the songs you're going to get going in. This was a match where you knew what you were going to get going in. Uh, credit to... I want to know who designs Bushi's masks. At least his over masks. Uh, if you don't know Bushi, part of his gimmick is that he wears... He, he has his normal mask, but he wears a mask over it that's designed to look freaky and terrific. This looked like sort of Venom if Venom had three tongues. And he pulls that off right before the match starts. And I'm always terrified... Having done performances where I wear multiple masks, I am terrified he's going to grab the wrong part of the mask at some point, and he's going to just rip his overmask and his actual mask off and accidentally reveal his face. I don't want that to happen. Uh, in the end, Will Ospreay picks up the victory over Bushi with the Stormbreaker. That's his new finishing maneuver that unfortunately both JR and Jim Barnett uh, Josh Barnett Jim Barnett bleh, running together the commentary team completely whiffed on that they the oh what a modified neck breaker by god barbecue sauce 
But no, it's called the Stormbreaker, and that sort of fits in with his King of the Skies uh, character. Good match intended to signal to the fans, I think, that we're going back to the Okada-Naito feud, uh, at least in the near future. That is not a bad thing. And I got the feeling this is going to be something that's going to happen at G1. We are looking at its title time. And, oh, Jim Ross does not get angry that often, but this was funny. JR made a, a technical error. He said, you know, every match for the rest of the evening is a title match, or words to that effect. And while calling a match that was a non-title tag team match. And apparently someone had the the guts to correct Jim Ross in his earpiece or over his headset or whatever. And he didn't like that. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, the rest of the matches for the night are title matches. So these will matter. Coming up next for the Junior Heavyweight Championship singles title, it's Hiromu Takahashi defending against Dragon Lee. This is the first time these two have met since the... Best of the Super Juniors tournament where Hiromu Takahashi really came into his own as the wild man. He was always eccentric, but he really got into this sort of wild and crazy, almost caveman-like persona during the G1 Climax this, uh, this past year. So we'll see how that mixes with his longtime rival, the man who took his mask, Dragon Lee. I am predicting the title will be retained only because Dragon Lee doesn't work for New Japan, and I don't think New Japan is ready to put all of their titles on Gaijin. That match was a hell of a lot better than it had any right to be. Uh, first and most importantly, Hiromu Takahashi retains the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship in a well-fought match. This was an even-steven back-and-forth match both men were portrayed as equals and i like that when it comes to a long-term personal feud you you give the idea that either one of these guys could beat the other any given day of the week a lot of high flying in this match we're in it this whole this whole show the story of been of the show has been this is what you expect from these characters from these acts and you're gonna get it and from these two, you would expect a hard-hitting, high-flying match with some stupid risks. And it was a hard-hitting, high-flying match with some stupid risks. Um, no major serious botches that I could see, but I have a terrible eye for that. The story continues. I don't expect this to be the last time we see these two. I'm expecting eventually a... Either a mask versus title or a mask versus hair match to be when Dragon Lee finally gets one over on Takahashi. For today, the champion retains the title. We are now moving forward. We've got two more matches. This is your semi final match of the evening. Now, unlike the United States, something I didn't mention in my top 10 New Japan Customs video, which is still available on the channel. In America, the match before the main event is not a desirable place to be. It's considered a breather, a filler, a chance for the, for the crowd to come down and relax before they are brought back up for the crescendo and the climax of the main event. Occasionally referred to rather derisively as the popcorn match, because this is the match where you're supposed to go to the concession stand and buy popcorn. Or... Let more crudely as the piss break match where you're supposed to go use the toilet. And for many years in WWE, it was also known as the Divas match. Not so in New Japan. Not so. The semi and this is because New Japan is the leader of professional wrestling in Japan, this sort of filters down through other companies like Dragon Gate and so forth, that the semi-final match is a high-profile match. It is secondary to the main event. But it is a desirable place to be. If, you've, if you're wrestling semifinals for New Japan, you've made it. You are a top guy. Or you're a major character, top of the mid-card, bottom of the top of the card. And that's what Juice Robinson is. Juice Robinson has been on a journey ever since he left NA NXT. And ever since he realized that CJ Parker, the Moonchild, 
was going to go exactly nowhere. He has reinvented himself as this old school, and I mean like 1970s, 1980s rock and roller, you know, blonde haired pretty boy babyface that, you know, the, the girls want, you know, the, the guys want to be and the girls want to, uh, to boink. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one where I'm predicting a title change. This is the one and only title change I am predicting for the evening. This is the United States Championship. I, yeah, it would be good for it to change hands in the United States. And Juice Robinson, the story they've been telling is that he's the guy who is very talented but never wins the big one. This is a dangerous story to tell. You can do it. It's been done very well in the past. But this is put up or shut up time. And if Robinson wins this, then he's the champion. He proved the doubters wrong. He's the hero. Blah de blah de blah de blah. If he loses, then the bad guy was right all along. And he's not a championship material. He doesn't belong in the main event. So put up or shut up time. Home field advantage for the moon for the former moon child. I think we're gonna see a title change. Oh god damn what an incredible match. Woohoo! Um okay, uh business first. We have a new IWGP US heavyweight champion and yes, in the Japanese version of the announcement they did say United uh, United States Heavy Kyoza Juice Robinson, he did it. And that's the business. Now the per now the personal, now the stuff that's going to be in the news, and probably already has been. I've been avoiding spoilers for this show, as I always do for a live-ish review. They hit Jim Ross. Okay. Um, more than half of this match, I'd say more than two third, more than three quarters probably, of this match happened outside the ring. And a lot of it involved wanton physical abuse of the guardrail. Well, one of the spots that they should have thought about before... Okay, I don't know if this was planned. I think it was. If it was, it's an incredibly poor taste. If it wasn't, then they're taking advantage of, a happy a of an unha unhappy accident. Here's the move. Jay White, who has been a total bastard the entire time suplexes Robinson into the guardrail right in front of the American announce team. The rail goes into the table. The table goes into Jim Ross, knocking him out of his chair and flat on his ass. This causes Josh Barnett, who I believe is an MMA fighter, to, to drop all pretense. Now, by the way, they swear a lot in New Japan. I was hoping the new management would get that under control. They haven't yet. Uh, tells Robinson, uh, sorry, tells uh, Jay White that he that quote, well, you just fucked all the way up now, didn't you, boy? <laughs> For all intents and purposes, calls him a motherfucker, and proceeds to actually leave the leave the ringside area, get into the ring to confront Jay White, who backs down, and this winds up delaying the match slightly. No contact between Barnett and either of the participants, so no grounds for disqualification. Speaking of disqualification, a special rule was announced immediately before the match began that if Juice Robinson, who has a broken left hand and he is a southpaw, if he uses his cast as a weapon, which he has done in the past, then he would be disqualified and therefore would not win the title. That was pretty much the only rule that was enforced the entire match. Jim Ross, and either he's a much better actor than I gave him credit for, and I give him a lot of credit, or he was tell or he was being legitimate here, was complaining up, down, and sideways throughout the match, especially after he got hit, that there were no rules here. The referees, quote, and this is Jim Ross saying this, need to get their shit together. And if Jim Ross tells you you need to get your shit together in wrestling, you you have shit and it needs to get together. It was a wonderful story of the underdog overcoming the odds and winning the day and just kicking ass. They did an excellent spot that I thought was going to be the climax where uh, Juice Robinson hits his pulp friction 
which is essentially Christian's old uh, unprettier slash kill switch maneuver. And that was actually for a two count. I thought that was going to be legitimate. The fans, this was the most heel heat I saw anybody get, I've seen anyone get all night so far. There were actual chants of fuck you switchblade, clap, 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 clap. One, that means someone's acknowledging the switchblade gimmick. I still don't know what it means. And two, these fans legitimately hated this guy. They wanted him to lose. And that's where the money is. So good, good, on, uh, good on the performers for that one. But in the end, uh, the part that's going to make the news is Jim Ross getting knocked on his ass. But the big story coming out of this, we have a new IWGP US champion, the third champion, and the first American. I did not know this about Switchblade Jay White. I thought he was either American or British. I'm not, I wasn't entirely sure. But it turns out he was actually a New Zealander. He was a Kiwi. I did not know because no one had ever made him say the word flig. And bonus points if you get that reference. So new United States champion. Congratulations to Juice Robinson. CJ Parker, the hippie jobber. The environmentalist, placard-waving, hippie jobber from NXT is now a singles heavyweight champion in New Japan Pro Wrestling. What a difference two or three years make. Good gravy. Speaking of the Americans, it's time for the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. Wow, that was actually a pretty good segue. I'm sorry, not Cody Rhodes. No, we can't say that. We can't say that. He is Cody. We cannot acknowledge his, uh, his last name, except for the fact everybody acknowledges his last name. Challenging... Kenny Omega for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. This is the second match between the two of them. The second one-on-one -on -one match between these two. The first happened in Ring of Honor. This is the first to happen in New Japan Pro Wrestling. It is your main event of the evening, and that title is on the line. Plot significance! We have plot significance! Narrative hath been advanced. Okay, that's enough of that. Oh, okay. Let's just run down the basics first. Uh, in order, entrances. I think what's kind of fun about the American Nightmare character is that he's kind of a little bit of a parody of WWE-style sports entertainment, for lack of a better term. Cody Rhodes comes out. I'm just going to call him Cody Rhodes because that's who he is. Cody Rhodes comes out in a fairly cheap-looking Thanos cosplay, I think is what he was going for, along with Barry the Business Bear. I am half expecting that to, at all in, be revealed as being CM Punk, but I digress. He comes out, there's a throne on the ramp, and four guys that I assume are from the LA Dojo carry Cody to the ring. You know, on you know, on the royal uh, litter, I think is what it's called. Kenny Omega, on the other hand, the man of the people, comes out, walks to the ring under his own power, accompanied by fellow members of Golden Elite, the Young Abakuzu. They would remain at ringside for the entire match, occasionally getting involved, but never uh, to a disqualification level. How do I describe this match? Again, this is exactly what you would expect out of these two guys. Intense, personal, good storytelling, and it was a well-done, well-put-together, intelligently thought-out match. There were some big risks, some big spots that were teased, a very dangerous thing where everybody was at the top of a ladder. And I don't mean a small one, I mean a very large ladder. The temptation was that somebody was going to get pushed off the ladder down to the floor through a table. What happened was a superplex backwards into the ring. That was still a big, dumb, stupid move to do, but not as stupid as going through the table. There was a powerbomb, a thrown powerbomb from the inside of the ring out, ostensibly through the table. Cody bounced off of the table. Fortunately, he hit with his shoulders and upper back, so he didn't actually hit his head. But the table the table didn't break, and it looked like Cody might have. In the end, after about a 30-minute match, longest match of the evening by far, K 
Kenny Omega wins with the one winged angel, Katsuyoko Notenshi, to retain the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. And that's when the story started. Okay, this was a couple of major plot beats, story beats, in about 10 minutes. Uh, they do the standard closing promo. This is a another custom that I didn't mention before in New Japan, where the winner of the main event does a brief on the mic promo in the ring. And Kenny Omega is pretty good at that, especially when he gets to speak English the whole time, as he did tonight. And he talks about how everybody deserves a second chance in life. And that includes Cody Rhodes. So he, he sort of vaguely alludes to a second chance before doing his catchphrase, I must bid you adieu, good night, and, sorry, goodbye, and good night, finger gun, bang. Be careful with those finger guns, that once killed a referee. And if you know what I'm talking about, you are very cool. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not cool enough for me to explain it to you. I will simply say, beware the underbrice. And leave it at that. So this looks like the end of the show. And then I notice, oh, wait a minute. We've got a good 15, 20 minutes left on the on the video here. Up at the top of the ramp, the Tongan faction of Bullet Club that we saw much earlier in the show. Uh, Tama Tonga, Tongaloa, and King Haku, a.k.a. Ming, come out and do the, 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 the solidarity. These guys have been on Team Kenny the whole time. And then, bam! The Tongans attack the Golden Elite, and then all of the Bullet Club comes out to try to help Kenny Omega, including people who have been on Team Cody this entire time. Hangman Page, Marty Skrull, everybody comes out for this. Uh, Yujiro Takahashi, who didn't really seem to care what was happening, and they all get beat down by the Tongans. Massive um, RKOs, or sorry, stun guns. Power bombs, big strikes from Haku that, for a man his age, looked, well, actually looked pretty terrible, but uh, it's Haku, I'm going to believe them. And then Cody limps his way to the ring, takes his time. At this point, the Tongans have started hitting people with steel chairs. Uh, I believe it was Tama Tonga hands Cody a chair, and I'm thinking, okay, this, this is going to go one of two ways. Cody's going to hedge his bets and join up with the Tongans, or he's going to defend the Team Cody members who have been attacked, and we now have a three-way Bullet Club civil war between Team Cody, Team uh, Kenny, and Team Tonga. Well, that's not what happens. Cody turns babyface, smacks, starts beating up the Tongans, uh, sorry, the the Tamatonga, the Gorillas of Destiny, beats up the Gorillas of Destiny when Ming grabs the steel chair away from him and the Tongans beat the crap out of Cody as well. So these three Tongan gentlemen, one of whom is an extremely old man, have just left the entire Bullet Club lying, or have they? Because at the top of the ramp, they haven't said a word, they haven't explained anything except for saying to Kenny, quote, you did this. They get back up to the top of the ramp, uh, pose with a Tongan flag, and one of them, again, I think it was Tama Tonga, says to the camera, this is real family. All this Team Kenny, Team Cody, bickering bullshit. No, 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 no. This is family. We are all equal. There is no leader. This is Bullet Club. So I think we do have a new phase to the Bullet Club Civil War. Team Tonga versus everybody because after they leave in the ring in a case now whether this is friendship forged in the crucible of combat or whether this is the enemy of my enemy is my friend i know not we will we may find out in the future but there's the handshake and the embrace between kenny and cody unified bullet club versus the tongans that is the new phase of the Bullet Club Civil War. Kenny Omega still your IWGP Heavy Kyoza. Final thoughts on the overall show. Honestly, skip the first two and a half hours. Most of this show was 
paint by numbers and fairly boring. Um, if you're a fan of Lucha Underground and are curious what a certain individual looks like without his mask, check out the Never Open Weight title match. Other than that, you can really skip to the last three bouts. Takahashi Dragon Lee, White Robinson, and Omega Cody. This was a three-match show. It was also an eight-match show. And as a result, I cannot give it a high marks. But I don't want to give it a bad... I don't want to give it a bad grade either because those last three matches were fan flipping tastic. And we actually had real tangible storyline progression, which the last time New Japan was in the States, when they thought they were going to be promoting Rey Mysterio versus Jushin Liger, and then that was going to be the main event, and then it wound up not happening. The, the last three matches didn't feel like a house show. This felt like a big match situation. So I'm really torn how to grade this. So I'm going to come out on the positive side. And I'm going to give this whole show, top to bottom, a C+. If you discount the first four to five matches, we're in A to A- minus range. But the whole show must be taken... And that's inc that includes the early, the early technical difficulties, that includes a few timing issues, vastly improved over their first appearance in the United States a year ago, but still noticeable and distracting. Uh, further points off, if, if that was a deliberate thing with Jim Ross, F you, New Japan. Yeah, you know, don't, don't risk the guy's health like that by making him do anything physical, especially anything that involves, you know, taking a chair to the, taking a table to the gut, essentially. If that was an accident, it was a stupid accident that shouldn't have happened. Credit to everybody involved for running with it, but no. I, I am totally against a, a senior citizen announcers taking bumps of any kind. Wonderful main event. Excellent, excellent semi-final if you like good old-fashioned underdog storytelling. And if you like just a spectacle junior heavyweight ch championship match in the, in the third place, fantastic. Rest of the show, skippable. Okay, the next big thing for New Japan is going to be the G1 Climax Tournament, which I will not be covering the, in its entirety. All I will say about the G1 Climax is if you want to see the tournament, that's fine. Skip everything that isn't a tournament match, because every New Japan tournament is a uh, tournament show is broken into two parts: the tournament matches that actually matter, and a bunch of get everybody on the card multi-man tag matches that don't. Skip those; they suck. They don't matter. Forget it. If you want to watch the tournament, I do recommend watching the tournament. It's one of the biggest setups in the New Japan calendar. I'm not going to be covering it all here. Might do the finale. Not sure yet. Until then, we, uh, we have, I've got some non-live-ish review. Last Wrestling Podcast episodes coming down the pipe. Until then, thank you for thank you for listening. Like, share, and subscribe. Do all that social media, youtube -y stuff that I really can't be bothered with. And until then, goodbye and good night. Bang. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not done. We are not finished yet. Okay, uh, for the first and hopefully last time on a live-ish review, I'm actually doing a post-edit uh, edition, whatever the heck I'm going to call this thing. <sighs> yeah, uh, since the show has happened and since I finished my initial viewing and recording, we have learned two things. One, uh, we can confirm that the spot with Jim Ross was not planned, at least that's what he's saying, and that everything with Barnett getting into the ring and cursing out Jay White was a apparently real. Um, now, it's possible that's all one massive work, but I'm willing to believe it for, this, for right now, that this is legitimate, that that was not planned. And, um, yeah, screw you. Both of you guys, everybody involved with that who's not Jim Ross, screw you. Um... Number two, oh, oh damn. 
I am embarrassed that I didn't even notice this. And maybe this is credit to the, the performance. Maybe this is credit to the performer. Maybe this is credit to the scientific nature of adrenaline. But apparently, the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, Hiromu Takahashi, has broken his neck. Or at least sustained a neck injury off of a move in that uh, Junior Heavyweight title match that I was praising in the actual show. In a match that I... In a move that I thought was a bridging package pile driver, that apparently wasn't what they intended to do, and he landed right on his neck. I thought it looked bad. Uh, I went back and I relooked at the spot. I thought he landed on his shoulders, but apparently, no, he actually landed on his neck, made it through the match, wow, and collapsed backstage, was flown back to Japan. The next day that actually gives me pause that actually makes me think this is a this isn't as bad as it could be because if you're able to fly from california to japan that's as well you're going to get a direct flight there um 14 hours 11 hours I th actually no it would be probably about 11 hours from california to uh narita and yeah you sh if your neck is severely broken that would be extremely difficult to do but he did make it back to Japan. He is receiving treatment. Any neck injury is serious. Any neck injury is career shortening. But we, it doesn't look like this is going to be career ending. It appears that Hiromu Takahashi has not been stripped of the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. New Japan does not like to do that just because somebody gets injured if they think that person will be back. So we are working under the assumption right now that he is going to recover and he's going to be okay, but a scary, dangerous, stupid spot that could have killed somebody. Uh, in light of this new information, I am revising my original score. I am dropping it down to a D plus, a full letter grade deduction for attacking, for basically injuring Jim Ross. Uh, he's apparently had cracked ribs, internal injuries, and for nearly ending the career of the time bomb. So I, I, still, I still maintain that the final two matches, the U.S. title match and the IWGP heavyweight title match, are good and worth seeking out. Skip the rest of the show. See you next time.